This conference will now be recorded. Okay, fine. Now today we'll see about sarcoidosis. Uh, you know something about uh, sarcoidosis? What kind of uh, disease it is? Any answer? Are you all there? Yes, ma'am. Please respond now and then so that I can understand that whether people are there or not because I am not seeing you directly, right? So it is very difficult for me to understand whether you are there or not or following or not. Otherwise, whether you are interested or not also. If you are not interested, I can just uh, skip it off. But I don't even uh, know whether you are interested or not because it's like I'm not seeing your faces. Okay, fine. Uh, sarcoidosis is something like a uh, chronic inflammatory disease and it can involve any organ in the body and uh, it, it is something very benign like uh, half of the percentage of persons can be recovering or it's like a self-limiting disease. So among all the rheumatological diseases which one if you want to consider something which is benign or if you want to uh, have a patient whom you want to treat uh, that patient for then you can uh, think like or like you know usually people prefer like to have sarcoidosis among rest of the connective tissue disorders because it is like half of them are self-limiting so they respond i mean uh, they by themselves uh, they get treated or like uh, they a uh, few other people when we give them steroids they respond very well okay so that is with sarcoidosis uh, it's a multi-system disease which is inflammatory due to inflammatory pathology and it is specifically having non-caseating granuloma. Something which you have to remember about sarcoidosis is non-caseating granuloma. Why? Uh, where do you see caseating granulomas? TB. Yeah, tuberculosis. So um, that is how you want to differentiate between tuberculosis and uh, between uh, sarcoidosis. That is a caseating granuloma and this is non-caseating granuloma. Uh, because in India where tuberculosis is very uh, prevalent, uh, we tend to misdiagnose most of the sarcoidosis cases also as a tuberculosis cases because most of the times when you find uh, some pulmonary complaints and when they have chest x-ray findings, you label them as uh, tuberculosis. So most of the sarcoidosis patients in India are also labeled as uh, tuberculosis patients. So that is the reason uh, we don't have a significant number of sarcoidosis cases in India. Whereas uh, mostly we find uh, the number of uh, cases of sarcoidosis belonging to the African American population. Uh, that is where we got to know about the disease. And in most of the patients, like at least half of the patient, it resolves by itself. Uh, rest of the people, it can have a chronic uh, progression of the disease. Sometimes it can lead to fibrosis, lung fibrosis, okay? And if you want to know about uh, why are you getting this type of uh, disease like sarcoidosis, uh, you don't know the exact uh, etiology like in a uh, well-defined way as you have for uh, like uh, SLE or rheumatoid arthritis but you have a uh, suspicion like it is uh, the factors to do with uh, both the genetical makeup as well as the environmental factors. The genetic factors are HLA-DRB1-1101 uh, that is the gene particularly found in the patients who are having sarcoidosis. Okay, that is the gene particularly found in the patients who are having sarcoidosis. Okay, some problem with the gene and which when associated with environmental triggers like infective and non-infective conditions, it can predispose to sarcoidosis. The infective conditions are most well labeled as propionibacterium acne. Okay, those are the one, those are the bacterial species which we have found out in the granulomas of the patients who are affected by sarcoidosis. And also in the previous uh, books, it was given uh, about mycobacteria and uh, um, Borrelia or also might have have some contribution, but uh, in the new edition of Harrison, only Propionibacterium uh, is given the importance. And non-infective conditions like uh, when uh, this uh, infectious conditions, when mixed with the non-infective conditions, either might be an insecticide, molds, etc., can contribute to the disease progression. Uh, the second important infective cause will be tuberculosis itself, both the typical and atypical mycobacteria. Like uh, when the uh, um, 
mycobacterium tuberculosis enters the body if we if we are able to uh, throw away the infection if we are able to control the infection uh, by our active immune system we won't develop any of the disease for example if uh, we are not able to eliminate the mycobacterium tuberculosis then we can develop tuberculosis and this sarcoidosis is something in between those two uh, if our body is able to control the infection but it is not able to throw away the antigen there is some uh, uh, antigens of uh, tuberculosis remains in our body then and our body reacts to that particular antigen then we can have sarcoidosis that is one of the proposed mechanism okay so in this mechanism what we uh, how we found out is retrospectively we know that we came to know that it is because of tuberculosis how because when we found the granuloma of a uh, sarcoidosis patient we found there is something like a tuberculosis uh, particular protein mcat g this protein when it was present when we then we came to know retrospectively thinking that it might be because the tuberculosis infection is inadequately eliminated from our body that is the reason we had uh, the particular uh, sarcoidosis that is the etiology now coming to pathogenesis what is happening here in pathogenesis what is happening is first when our body is exposed to a particular antigen either it may be propionibacterium or like tuberculosis mcat g as i have told you before these are the antigens these antigens are i mean whenever that microorganism is taken by a macrophage it is degraded and the antigen of that uh, particular microorganism is uh, taken up by the macrophage and it is shown to the cd4 cells or uh, t cells so in the same way as like any other antigen anti uh, any other antigen mechanisms or any other foreign body mechanisms Our uh, tuberculosis or propionate uh, bacterium antigen particles are shown by our antigen presenting cells, for example, a macrophage, by its MHC complex. Like uh, all the antigen presenting cells have HLA class two molecule. So, with the help of that class two molecules, these antigens are uh, uh, exp- uh, these antigens are shown to the uh, T cells. so the t cells initially the naive t cells become the cd4 cells so we are showing this antigen to the cd4 cells so there is a mnc uh, of uh, macrophage and t cell receptor interaction because of this uh, antigen the antigen which uh, might be either propionibacterium or tuberculosis so once the antigen is uh, taken up by the cd4 cell uh, it Uh, it uh, produces uh, several interleukins or like uh, cytokines one of them uh, like the few of them are interleukin 2 and interferon gamma interleukin 2 is helpful in the self proliferation of cd4 cells or uh, cd4 t helper cells so the t cell number is continuously increasing because of interleukin 2 and interferon gamma interferon gamma is something which stimulates the macrophages whatever the cell which has uh, applied it with an antigen that cell it is going to stimulate so the macrophages are going to increase in number so in this way if you want to see this uh, the particular diagram which uh, you are able to see on the screen that is like a vicious circle you are constantly that macrophage is constantly showing some antigen to the uh, t helper cell and the t cell helper cell is producing interleukin to interferon gamma which in turn stimulating either the t helper cell and as well as the macrophage so uh, the proliferation is increasing very rampantly and the macrophage usually what does it produce it produces interleukin 12 18 and tnf so these all results in uh, excess number of uh, macrophages and the macrophages contribute to formation of the granuloma whatever you are seeing in the left top uh, left bottom corner that is a granuloma and if this granuloma has more amount of uh, interleukin 10 production it indicates resolution if more amount of tnf interleukin 8 endothelin are uh, produced and it results in fibrosis see these two are the two different uh, mechanisms how the sarcoidosis uh, uh, presents in the future see if at all interleukin 10 is present the resolution is there out of uh, the all the sarcoidosis patients half of them are resol- uh, having the resolution so interleukin 10 is becoming more in these patients in rest of the half it's not like half the patient few among the rest of the half 
few patients will progress to fibrosis because of tnf alpha interleukin 8 and endothelium okay that is about the pathogenesis so in the pathology what you see is here there is a granuloma which we already uh, discussed but that granuloma is not caseating it is a non caseating so the granuloma and in the pathology if you do histopathology examination the important things which you can uh, find are uh, you can see inclusion bodies the inclusion bodies are three types shaman bodies asteroid bodies residual bodies and crystalline inclusions the most ones are first three shaman asteroid and residual bodies and they can these can calcify anywhere when you are having a lacking a granuloma and which is not having an adequate uh, uh, blood supply or uh, things it can get calcified it's like the any other uh, thing so that is about the pathogenesis now coming to epidemiology uh in uh, usually females are most commonly affected than males uh it has uh, the age prediction in uh, bimodal pred uh, prediction is there first you see in the second and third decades of life and uh, others you can see in the elderly so usually the median age of presentation is around uh, 55 years um and it usually we see in african american populations or like the uh, you, you better call like the disease is very severe in african american population rest of us it's like it is present but it is not as severe as in african american population so next coming to the uh, clinical features even uh, as i told you before like um, african americans are affected commonly it is not only just commonly they are affected but also these patients are having the uh, more severe disease either it might be uveitis or pulmonary disease or the neurological manifestations everything is more severe in case of uh, african americans um, compared to the rest of the population but only one thing is more prevalent in uh, white population that is hypercalcemia okay next coming to the clinical features Uh, as i already told you it is a multi system disease it can involve any organ in the body but most commonly uh, it is usually asymptomatic initially patient might not even present also but sometimes it can have symptoms like respiratory cutaneous ocular and some non specific complaints usually non uh, non specific constitutional symptoms among them the most common is fatigue fever night sweats uh, etc but uh, like uh, if you want to consider the most uh, common symptom or most common constitutional symptom that is fatigue and sometimes fatigue might uh, not just be because of your tiredness or anything it can be because of small fiber dysregulation also small fiber nerve uh, dysregulation so that is uh, the main uh, clinical features you can have uh, uh rest of the in uh, rest of the uh, system involvement also like it can involve any organ from head to toe so um the but the most common presentation will be uh, with the lung manifestation which is accounting for a 95 percentage of population which usually presents with a dry cough and most of the cases of sarcoidosis that's the reason i'm going to the pulmonary uh, medicine department and where you can find the cases but there also if it is in india you always tend to misdiagnose as uh, tuberculosis and the number of cases are not reported good in number and but why is it important to uh, know whether it is uh, sarcoidosis because sarcoidosis has very good prognosis and if you know the disease you give the treatment of steroids the patient respond very well okay then uh, the next common manifestations are skin eye uh, lymph nodes uh, liver spleen neurological and cardiac involvement uh, if you see uh, presentation when the patient comes uh, with some kind of presentation most commonly it will be uh, lung involvement dry cough etc but uh, that is in the first presentation if you follow up the patient for a few months or like two years or around then you can uh, tend to have more of the secondary symptoms coming into play either the skin manifestation or eye manifestations etc can be present cardiac and neurological uh, sarcoidosis are very rare uh, the percentage is very less uh, as you can see either in neurological 5% cardiac is too but the follow up cases of neurological like long standing neurological cases of sarcoidosis you can have uh, a pretty good number 
but cardiac is very very rare so coming to the uh, individual system uh, involvement uh, lungs uh, 95% of the cases are uh, having the lung uh, symptoms as a manifestation symptoms dry cough uh, uh, and um, shortness of breath can occur uh, among them 50% have uh, permanent lesions uh, 5 to 15% have uh, progress to fibrosis rest of us have uh, they can uh, have uh, the normal in their course they can get back to their normal so what happens is uh, there is a staging system for lung involvement in case of uh, sarcoidosis first lymph node infiltration occurs that you can see on chest x ray as lymph node infilt uh, bilateral hilar lymphadenopathy you can see uh, the second uh, manifestation will be interstitial infiltration all the macrophages or uh, the lymphocytes you can uh, see diffuse involvement of the lung but you can mostly in sarcoidosis it will be the upper lobe involvement uh, do you know what are the other conditions where upper lobe is involved examples examples of it, upper lobe involvement people respond otherwise i won't know whether you are there or not also Are you all there? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Respond. Yes, you're sleeping. You're sleeping, right? You are, no one is listening, probably. You took so long to respond. Just like a one, uh, yes, I would have gone uh, forward. At least if rest of the sleep also, one person be awake just to respond when I ask. Okay? Okay, ma'am. Yeah. Now we are convinced. So what is the upper? Yeah, you didn't answer me. You started talking, but you didn't answer me. What are the conditions where upper lobe of lung is involved? Any answer? Upper lobe of lung involvement. The one disease which we are all uh, from the beginning itself we are talking about when I was talking about sarcoid that itself you are uh, one of the answer for the question which I asked you what is that answer any takers see this is something which I am expecting from you without you saying I can't move forward Answer, please. Are you there? Yes, ma'am. Ah, uh, answer, ma. What is the one which we are talking about? Which infection did we talk from the first? Everything is Greek and Latin, madam. I don't understand what you are saying also. You wanted to say? What is the question I asked you? Okay, answer this. What is the question I asked you? The disease where the upper lobe of the lung is involved. Yeah, yeah. Okay, fine. So upper lobe of lung is involved in in other conditions like tuberculosis. First year answer should be tuberculosis. Okay. So that is the one we discussed from the beginning, right? So you should be uh, easily telling that thing. So tuberculosis, silicosis, both infectious and non-infectious causes can be there. Infectious are uh, like uh, 
tuberculosis. Non-infectious, you have the list of uh, silicosis, uh, Langhans cell histiocytosis, uh, hypersensitivity pneumonitis, etc. Can we involve the upper lobe of the lung? So uh, that is the usual uh, upper lobe infiltration uh, symptom. I mean, usual upper lobe infiltration. Uh, then you can uh, the patient even can present with the A B disease and pleural effusion. But pleural effusion is very rare, almost nil. Uh, it's like uh, you don't see it also. And uh, you, uh, the coming to the presentation, it can be cough, uh, dyspnea on exertion, chest pain, obstructive symptoms can be there. Hemoptysis can be present, but it is very very rare. Asymptomatic patients, you can see most of the patients are asymptomatic. Okay. And uh, coming to lung disease, you can have obstructive symptoms as well as sometimes you can have a uh, restrictive pattern also. Decreased uh, lung volume capacities can be found out. Okay. Sometimes uh, capa uh, the capacities and everything are, will be normal, but the patient can complain of all the symptoms. Okay. Coming to the chest x ray uh, staging, as I told, there is a staging system. Uh, the staging system in the first stage or in the first picture which you see, there is bilateral hilar radionopathy. Uh, in the second uh, picture, you can see uh, bilateral hilar adenopathy plus infiltrates all over the lung. Okay. In the third picture, you can see all the infiltrates covering all over the lung. Yeah. In the stage four, there is fibrosis. Okay. These are the four uh, stages of uh, sarcoidosis and chest X-ray staging is one accepted method of staging in case of sarcoidosis. There is CT staging also. CT findings are also there, but usually we don't... Uh, um, go with the CT uh, staging. We just do the X-ray, and because usually the patients present very late, uh, because they might be asymptomatic for very long, and when the symptoms that come also, it will be dry cough, which patient patient need not always come for a opinion from a doctor, so they tend to neglect. So by the time they get uh, come here to us, it's like we have some uh, uh, chest X-ray changes. If at all they come early, you can do CT. And uh, in CT, you can have uh, different findings. There is a thing called as nodular uh, sarcoid. Multiple bilateral lung nodules are present with minimal hilar adenopathy. Consolidation, minimal miliary opacities can be found like that of tuberculosis. Reticular, uh, linear reticular pattern is seen. Uh, cavity can be present, but it is very, very, very rare, almost nil. CT chest findings are hilar and mediastinal adenopathy, peribronchial wall thickening can be present reticular nodular opacities as peribronchial wall thickening is present or infiltrates are around the bronchial area so you when you do the bar studies or like uh, uh, tissue histopathology from the uh, endoscopic uh, bronco uh, when bronchoscopy when you are doing when you take the peribronchial tissue your uh, tissue sample is uh, indicative of diagnosis and you get a very uh, easy uh, access and uh, Usually, you tend to find a granuloma, which suggests you a sarcoidosis. Yeah? Did you want to ask me anything? Any doubts? Any doubts? No, ma'am. Ma okay. Reticular nodular opacities can be present, and thickening of the bronchovascular bundles can be present. And nodules around the bronchi vessels, subpleural uh, regions, etc. Subpleural region involvement is something of uh, like sarcoidosis. Traction bronchitis can be present, fibrosis can be present, which leads to distortion of architecture, and lung fibrosis leading to. Depth. That is the that is to do with the uh, chest uh, CT chest uh, findings or sarcoidosis and uh, upper lobe infiltrates. As I already told you, uh, upper lobe is involved in case of uh, you can dif uh, differentiate it like uh, infectious and non-infectious. Infectious causes are pulmonary tuberculosis and pneumocystis carney pneumonia. Okay are infectious, non-infectious, silicosis, sarcoidosis, hypersensitivity, Langhans cell histiocytosis, and um, ankylosing spondylitis is not like direct upper lobe involvement, but because of uh, um, the stiffening of bones and all, you can have the upper lobe involvement. 
uh, not directly, but it can you can have an indirect effect as well as radiation immunitis, depending on how your the exposure is. And bilateral adenopathy, hilar lymphadenopathy. Uh, the differential diagnosis are infectious conditions like mycobacteria, fungal, mycoplasma, HIV, etc. Malignancy like lymphoma, uh, lympho, uh, lymphoid granulomatosis, lung cancer, metastasis can have bilateral lymphadenopathy. In organism, just like silicosis, periliosis. Uh, anti associated uh, GPA and EGPA. Both of them have hilar uh, lymphadenopathy. In others, you have hypersensitivity, immunitis, lantern cell histiocytosis, lymphocytic interstitial pneumonia, which you see in Jogan syndrome. Okay. Now coming to the airway disease, 50% have obstructive airway disease, large or the small airway obstruction may be present. And then many response to bronchodilators and steroids. Uh, plural disease is very rare, less than 1%, they can have chylothorax. But that is very, very rare, which you can almost uh, forget. And other findings are in PFT, you can have decreased volume, uh, lung volumes, usually finding like uh, obstructive pattern, DLCO is reduced. And pulmonary artery hypertension can be present, which can be either because of direct pulmonary vasculature involvement leading to pulmonary artery hypertension or secondary to pulmonary fibrosis, which cause pulmonary hypertension. Okay. So till now, what we talked is about the lung involvement. Coming to the skin involvement. In, uh, in the skin involvement, you can have all these different uh, modes of presentation. The maculopapular uh, rash is the first one. That is the most common chronic manifestation of sarcoidosis. Okay. One thing you should remember. Most common chronic uh, skin manifestation of sarcoidosis is maculopapular rash. And uh, lupus perineus, the second picture. It is the involvement of the bridge of the nose and just below the eye and cheek. That is lupus perineus. And this is also a, a chronic manifestation of Jogren syndrome. Sorry, sarcoidosis. And then coming to the third picture on the right, that is uh, erythema nodosum. It is a transient and acute phenomena. And when uh, erythema nodosum is there, uh, usually the patient will have peri, uh, peri arthritis of the ankle joint. But need not always go to each other, but they can have. In case of uh, Lofgren syndrome, when erythema nodosum is there, uh, it is not always that periarthritis of the ankle joint is there. It cannot be there also. And fourth picture is the subcutaneous nodules. Subcutaneous nodules of sarcoid are different compared to that of uh, rheumatoid nodules. And that is one of the differential. Uh, I mean, how, how you have to differentiate is one of the questions. Then you can have hyperpigmented uh, patches. And then the nodule are sarcoidosis. And coming to the skin manifestation, there is a uh, plaque. Uh, formation ulcerations can be present, varicose uh, deposits, and angiolipoid uh, sarcoid and nail sarcoid can be present. Scar sarcoid is one of the uh, uh, different entities. And then coming to the syndromes in case of uh, sarcoidosis, uh, Lofgren syndrome and uh, lupus perineum are something which you have to remember. Lupus perineum is a chronic form which I already told you before, and then Lofgren syndrome is. Consisting of erythema nodosum, hilar adenopathy, polyarthritis, these three can be present. But erythema nodosum need not always be with polyarthritis and fever can be there. See, when erythema nodosum is there, that is an acute phenomenon. Okay? Now, so up to now, we have seen about lung involvement and skin involvement. In skin involvement, how you want to diagnose? By, diag uh, by a biopsy. Biopsy shows non caseating granuloma. And you have to rule out foreign body reaction, glucose, virus, tuberculosis, leprosy, drug eruptions, and DNA. When I showed you picture, you might have uh, thought about uh, one of these differentials. At least leprosy, you have, might have uh, had a, as a differential diagnosis. And then the third common organ involved is eye. Uh, the most common manifestation is anterior pruritus, but most significant or like uh, the specific manifestation will be posterior uveitis. You can also see intermediate uveitis. One third patients will have chorioretinitis, retinal vasculitis. Uh, the common
commonest is anterior uveitis in 75 to 80 percent 70 percent patients you have anterior uveitis in 50 percent of the patients you can have keratoconjunctivitis sicca or sicca syndromes uh you see the first picture is something like uh, uh it is uh, the anterior uveitis picture and uh, you know all these retinal vasculitis and uh, the granuloma in the sarcoid in the fourth picture those all and then coming to the other ocular manifestation late complications in untreated patients they can have secondary glaucoma cataract formation and blindness can occur extra articular manifestations usually uh, like palpable orbital mass can be present dacro retinitis can be present uh, because of lacrimal gland involvement and extra ocular muscle involvement can be there optic sheath involvement can be present so optic sheath involvement or like optic neuritis is like coming under the manifestations of uh, uh, cranial nerve involvement which we'll see later then he put Hello, are you all there? Yes, ma'am. Okay, you can see, right? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma you can see the PPT, right? Yes. Okay, fine. What's happening here? Can you see? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Someone's mic uh, like on. Okay, heat fraud syndrome is like a fever, uveitis. Parotid enlargement and facial pal nerve palsy can be there. That is Hedford syndrome. And uh, the next common organ involvement. So now we talked about uh, lung involvement, eye involvement, skin involvement, and then coming to the eye involvement. Now we are going to see about the other solid organ involvement, like liver, spleen, CNS, uh, etc., which can be involved. In the liver involvement, usually the granulomas are present. Not that all patients will present with some clinical manifestation, but on uh, asymptomatic patients also, when you do, do LFTs, you might uh, find one of these abnormalities. Usually, they are present with elevated alkaline phosphate levels, which is the most common uh, abnormality. Um, after that, they can have the elevated transaminase levels also, which uh, takes time to have, uh, like occur and it when it gets to an extent or like when it becomes severe then you start having the bilirubin levels increasing okay the symptoms are they don't have usually any kind of symptoms but when it becomes severe they can have the symptoms of intrahepatic cholestasis and at that time the patient can uh, present with portal hypertension okay so uh, so you to diagnose liver biopsy is done where you can find granulomas in 50 percent of the biopsied uh, cases of sarcoidosis okay and in these cases if you do a uh, treatment is like uh, if they are uh, going to pulmonary hypertension you can do liver transplantation but usually it has a good response to systemic uh, steroids um, sarcoidosis so you can go for the transplantation but uh, the thing is um, a case of uh, sarcoidosis which has undergone uh, liver transplantation that person had sarcoidosis again or granuloma again in the liver which has been transplanted to him later so it means like it is a systemic disease like you can't prevent it just because of transplantation uh, spleen involvement can also be present but when spleen involvement is there spleen is so it's like usually splenomegaly also is not uh, commonly seen but uh, when you have uh, like uh, 
um, uh, usually like might be like five to ten percent of the patients can have uh, splenomegaly. But if you have in symptomatic patients also, if you do uh, screen biopsy, like fifty percent of the cases can have uh, granulomas of sarcoid. Okay. Then uh, that is about the liver and spleen involvement. And the next in uh, next in, uh, in organ involvement is nervous system involvement. One minute. CNS involvement. Usually, what you see is like cranial nerve involvement, and among the cranial nerves, optic nerve and uh, seventh cranial nerves are commonly involved. Sometimes, uh, usually, it's like very important for you to take the history of seventh cranial nerve involvement because uh, sometimes a patient can have something like a Bell's palsy, and which the patient can recover, which might be because of sarcoidosis. They can think like uh, uh, they usually think like it is Bell's palsy, and they you don't give the history of sarcoidosis. I mean, history of that that to uh, uh, us when we are thinking in terms of sarcoidosis. So we don't get good number of organs for the diagnosis. Like that way we can miss. So it is important for you to ask about the patient nerve palsy. We can have also peripheral neuropathies. Granulomatous lesions can be present in the brain and spinal cord. Uh, so parenchymal nodules can be present. And, and it can be seen as hyper intense uh, white matter changes in the MRI. Neuroendocrine manifestations can be present. Cheeses, cognitive dysfunction, and focal neurological deficits can be present, which can be vascular, perivascular involvement. Meningitis, pachy meningitis can be present. Spinal cord syndromes can be present. Okay, these are the CNS involvement. What you don't see in case of sarcoidosis is encephalopathy. Rest of the things can be most of the things can be present in uh, CNS involvement or sarcoid or neurosarcoid. Usually, you have to differentiate it with, with, uh, with that of uh, multiple sclerosis. In multiple sclerosis, also patient present with all the abnormalities, but the thing and also the MRA uh, uh, findings will be like uh, uh, white matter intense lesions in case of uh, uh, multiple sclerosis as well as neurosarcoid. But how can you differentiate those both because of the history and because of the clinical features like in sarcoidosis you can have in sarcoidosis you can have other organ involvement as well as any uh, any guess see as you, uh, at usually the one as i told you before the CNS and uh, the, I mean to say, the peripheral nervous system and spinal cord, whatever these I told, that is common to multiple sclerosis and sarcoidosis. But in sarcoidosis, as it is a multi system organ involvement, it can involve the hypothalamus and uh, pachy meningitis or meningitis, you can see. Whereas in multiple sclerosis, there is no meningitis. So in CT also, you don't uh, get the meningeal enhancement in case of multiple sclerosis, whereas in sarcoid, you can get it. Uh, so CSF findings are lymphocytic pleocytosis can be uh, pleocytosis can be present, elevated protein levels and elevated ACE levels can be present. Then uh, imaging contrast enhanced MRI uh, you can do, and that gives the finding as I told you before, white matter uh, lesions in the pa uh, parenchyma. Coming to the uh, spleen bone marrow lymph nodes, uh, splenic granuloma I told you like more number of patients you get. But uh, only enlargement is in 5 to 10 percent. But granulomas are 60 to 70 percent of patients. So in a symptomatic patient also, if you take a spleen biopsy, 60 percent to 70 percent, you can have granulomas. And the features of hypersplenism are there, but it is very rare. Uh, and the splenectomy is very rarely uh, needed because of massive splenomegaly, which can lead to pancytopenia. And the most common abnormality is lymphopenia because sarcoidosis is something to do with the Elevated number of CD help four helper cells. So those are uh, being used at the sites of granuloma. So when you uh, the most common abnormality will be the lympho uh, lymphopenia. Okay, anemia is there in the 20% of patients, and extra the lymph node involvement is in 20% of the cases. Anemia is because of anemia of chronic disease, and then cardiac involvement. Or cardiac sarcoid. 
the common involvement will be in the myocardium and uh, that usually occurs as conduction block both it can uh, it can present as uh, tachyarrhythmia or bradyarrhythmia and ventricular uh, arrhythmias can occur uh, valvular disease also can occur uh, but uh, tachyarrhythmias are something common and uh, it can lead to sudden cardiac death uh, tachyarrhythmias are most common cause of death in sarcoidosis and it is due to patchy involvement of uh, sarcoid in the myocardial tissue it is not always uh, feasible for you to do ablation therapy so you need to go for an icd implanted cardiac defibrillator so you can diagnose by ecg where you can have to get arrhythmias yeah like echocardiogram shows uh, some um, cardiomyopathy changes either the dilated cardiomyopathy is more common uh, cardiac mri or pet scan can be done which shows the uptake uh, which shows uh, high intensity cardiac uh, uptake granuloma uptake in the pet scan endomyocardial uh, biopsy can be done but it is very risky better to avoid and musculoskeletal symptoms are present in 5% of patients and they can uh, present with acute arthritis uh, acute, that uh, phenomenon is locklin syndrome associated with erythema nodosum um, and chronic arthritis can also be present which is oligo or polyarticular and joint erosion periosteal bone disorption can occur but it is also very rare uh, sarcoid uh, myopathy uh, in that there is infiltration of this uh, granulomas into the muscle substance of the muscle so when you take the mri of that particular area you can have the uh, peripheral enhancement in the when you give the contrast so that is how you can uh, differentiate and myalgia uh, arthralgia are one of the common complaints for uh, if, um, the first one is anyhow it is fatigue most common constitutional symptom that might be asked as your mcq there can be myalgia arthralgia also x ray mri pet isotope scan muscle biopsy emg can be done other organ involvement are uh, kidney can be involved rarely uh, like 5% of the cases you can find granuloma but the kidney involvement uh, need not be or it's not always like uh, direct kidney involvement it can be more due to hypercalcemia why hypercalcemia occurs the granuloma in the lung usually produce have higher activity of uh, one hydro, uh, alpha hydroxylase so this tend to increase or like conversion to 125 dihydro uh, di, uh, dihydroxylase when this increases it is uh, it increases the more calcium absorption from our intestine so that is how you get uh, hypercalcemia levels or like you get more hypercalcemia and the hypercalcemia can tend to have renal failure okay and upper respiratory tract uh, involvement can be there like dry cough is one of the presenting presenting a symptom i told you like not the productive cough which is lower respiratory tract uh, there is uh, thyroid involvement um, which is very 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 rare uh, solitary thyroid nodule can be present but the patient usually don't present with any thyroid hormonal abnormality and usually sarcoid doesn't affect breast testis ovary and stomach and this kevin stillbacks test is a uh, test of uh, historical test which is not done now uh, that is nothing but uh, taking a, it is an intradermal injection of uh, splenic tissue of an affected sarcoidosis patient when you give to a new patient intradermally if the patient develops a granuloma in that area you diagnose him to be sarcoid patient it is very specific but sensitivity is very less so and also it is not that feasible like you take a splenic uh, infiltrate from an uh, infectious person and give it to him it is like no one uh, tends to accept that so now it is not uh, that feasible as a test to take in, take into consideration then gallium scan uh, usually gallium scan you uh, see the higher uptake of uh, Uh, the material into the glands which are involved that is how you can do but uh, usually that is also obsolete now we are going for uh, pet scan if we are really interested in knowing about uh, which gland is involved how is the body involvement and mri for uh, usually for the neurological involvement ace levels are elevated in uh, case of uh, sarcoidosis patient which is more than 50% of normal levels are elevated mild elevation of ace levels are seen in diabetics also but more than 50% of uh, ace levels increase is like uh, something uh, seen in sarcoid 
but it is not just specific to sarcoid because it can be seen in other conditions also okay and then coming to cd4 cd8 ratio uh, which you see in the bronco uh, alar uh, lagish uh, where you can uh, have the um, uh, ratio which is uh, usually they gave it reverse cd8 to 4 uh, which is very uh, less because cd4 cells are mostly involved in the areas of uh, uh, granuloma and then vitreous involvement you can have that is uh, nothing but uh, uveitis you have and then uh, vitreous uh, opacities can be there secondary to the infection of the uh, your uh, uveitis then coming to the diagnosis if there is a compatible uh, clinical uh, clinical uh, features and radiological uh, features and uh, if there is the history proper history and you are having some radiological features or if radiology is not there and if you have a histology where you found out there is a granuloma and you don't have any other differential diagnosis or if you have ruled out rest other differential diagnosis then you can label this as um, sarcoidosis and coming to the um, diagnosis of sarcoid as i already told you if at all you have a biopsy showing granuloma which is consistent with the features of sarcoidosis label as sarcoidosis but if you don't have any of those then you go for the other differentials and rule out all those and then when you rule out then you can come to uh, sarcoidosis as conclusion so if you have uh, what are the features suggesting of sarcoidosis chest x rays skin lesions uveitis optic neuritis hypercalcemia and uh, cranial neoplasms can be present so when these are there that is the clinical features then you biopsy if you don't want to biopsy do bronchoscopy where you can see ball uh, cd4 to 8 ratio needle aspirate of the granuloma if any of those are positive then you say sarcoid if they are not positive then go for ac levels ball lymphocytes and positive gallium sign if they are there yes it is um sarcoid if not then go for alternate diagnosis so when you want to treat uh, treat the cardiac abnormality eye involvement and nervous system involved abnormal lfts chest x ray etc can be there so you have to monitor so what is the treatment as i already told you in the initial time itself like uh, sarcoid is something which responds very good to steroids so uh, if it is a uh, you differentiate either it is an acute or chronic acute is something like the patient present and it is less than 2 years uh, you have a patient with you if he doesn't have any involvement just you keep monitoring the patient if it has a single organ uh, disease you can try on um if it is uh, localized refer skin and eye you can go for the topical therapy if it is like multi system involvement you can go for glucocorticoids oral glucocorticoids and you can uh, start them on uh, uh, 30 to 40 mg of uh, steroids and then gradually taper to less than 10 grams and if you are able to taper well and good if you don't you're not able to taper then you can uh, think of uh, methotrexate and hexq and then uh, in chronic illness also if glucocorticoids are something which patient can take you can uh, uh, keep him on steroids and uh, continue for less than 10 mg and then if he is able to tolerate continue or like if not you can try for the alternate uh, things or like uh, immunomodulatory drugs like methotrexate hcq azathioprine mycophenolate and minocycline if they are not uh, effective or if Uh, they are not able to recover with the these particular method etc etc then you can uh, consider biologicals in biologicals you can use either infliximab or cyclophosphamide but you don't go to that extent and then uh, non steroid first e steroid once if not steroid then you can go for chloroquine hydroxychloroquine but uh, uh, it is uh, good for cutaneous lesions hypercalcemia and bone lesions chloroquine is better minocycline for cutaneous lesions others are methotrexate which you can for cutaneous uh, lesions and also periarthritis azathioprine mycophenolate cyclophosphamide talidomide and fleximab so coming to the pulmonary sarcoid uh, when you have to bother like you when you are like when do you want to uh, take a big step on his uh, treatment is like when his symptoms are uh, deteriorating or like uh, lung pfp showing deterioration or like uh, um his uh, deterioration has going to uh, worse even more and your uh, chest x ray or ct involvement is increasing or like uh, more amount of infiltrates you are finding that is with the 
uh, pulmonary sorbate that is uh, the life threatening cause so you have to take an active step in case of pulmonary sorbate and also if uh, there is a neurological involvement or myelitis or myelopathy then you can have uh, the patient can present as paraparesis so at that case in those cases you need to be very vigilant and uh, give the treatment as soon as possible but anyway it is like uh, very rare sarcoidosis in uh, india i mean like might not be rare but uh, what the number we are giving from our indian side is very less so that is how it is and then coming to the adverse prognostic factors are uh, lupus perineum chronic uveitis um age of onset more than 40 years chronic hypercalcemia nephrocalcinosis black race nasal mucosal involvement cystic bone lesions neurosarcoidosis and myocardial involvement these are the adverse effect uh, adverse prognostic factors in case of neuros uh, in case of sarcoidosis so that is the thing with the sarcoidosis i hope at least uh, like uh, 20 to 50 percent might have uh, you might have uh, got even what i told you if you have any doubts you can uh, ask me got it is everyone there yes ma'am yes ma'am yeah. yes ma'am so you give your attendance any doubts either this class or any of the previous classes oh ma'am okay fine give your attendance if you have any doubts or anything you keep uh, message me thank you